So thank you, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here. I was driving actually to work yesterday morning and I turned on uh, WBEZ and heard an interview, Tony Sirabia interviewing uh, Brad Keywell about Chicago Ideas Week and I thought, what a wonderful idea this is. I'm so glad to be part of it. So I would like to tell you a little bit about energy the next 50 years. So we heard from Jim and uh, we heard from Philip, uh, two views, one more general and one more specific about energy. But I, uh, but I want to tell you, uh, uh, look into the future, predict a little bit what may happen, and tell you what I think should happen. And I'll stress in that, and I wonder if I could get my slides up, actually. There we are. Uh, here are my messages. Oh, I need the, uh, the clicker. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so here are the messages I want to leave with you. The world in 50 years depends on the energy choices that we make today. It takes that long for things to happen. I'll give you my top priorities, there are only three of them, for what I think society ought to look like in 50 years and the energy uh, directions that we need to pursue. I want to talk a little bit about discovery science, about how it drives what the world will do, and in particular what energy will do in 50 years. And then the last slide, a little bit about an innovation system for Chicago. So here we go. So uh, we already know this, I think everyone in this room, that energy is what drives society. It defines how much you can aspire to. It also puts limits on what you can do. When energy is expensive, everything gets difficult. When energy is cheap, the sky becomes the limit. So here are some of the things that energy gives us, things like transportation, our food supply, our cities, and we live in places like that building there, the John Hancock, medical technology, and of course communication. Uh, and we need energy for all of those. So in a way, energy is just the very basic piece of society. It takes a long time for the energy system to change. So if you look here, the uh, uh, graph from Stephen Chu, our Secretary of Energy, published in Nature about six weeks ago, and this article is very much worth a look. You see from 1850 to the year 2000, wood, coal, oil, gas, it takes about 50 years for the system to change from wood to coal, for oil to become dominant, for gas to become as prominent as it is. And that's the time scale that we have to work with. So fortunately, that time scale is long enough to actually impact it. We can direct it instead of following it. Uh, and if we make intelligent choices, we can determine what the world will look like 50 years from now. So I'll give you my top three societal needs, and then I'll talk in the bottom half of this slide about the, the energy challenges and the science directions that are needed to achieve them. So I think energy security, sustainability, and predictability are very important. So you can't really make plans for the future, and one of the problems we have now is that the predictability of energy supply and cost is pretty low, so we make, therefore, short-term plans. We want to look at the next six months or the next year instead of the next 10 years or the next 50 years, which we could do if indeed our energy supply were reliable. So this is basic to everything. It's basic to our personal needs. It's basic to our social, our professional, our civic, and our commercial life. It just uh, informs everything. And we need safe, abundant energy from inexp inexpensive sources. So that's the first thing. Second thing, again, my priority, stable climate. So we don't want to pay the cost, both the human cost and the capital cost, of serious climate change. And we can do that by curbing our carbon emissions. So that's the second thing. Third thing, economic development and growth. This is important to everyone. It's important to the developing countries. It's important to the developed countries. It's important to each one of us personally. Uh, and that means that you have to have inexpensive, abundant energy. So you may have different priorities, and I know there are many out there, but these are the three that I think are very important over the next 50 years. How do we get there? Here's what the energy technologies that we need in order to achieve these goals. And I'll give you three. There are many, but these three stand out, I think, as quite bold uh, and things you can do in 50 years. So first one, replace or displace coal and oil with abundant, cheap, and safe shale gas. And I'll tell you on the next view graph why I think this is a good idea. The second one, mitigate the carbon emissions. You hear a lot about let's do carbon sequestration, put the carbon dioxide underground. 
uh, so that we can continue to burn the, the fossil fuels that we have while they last. I have a different idea. I think we should take that carbon dioxide and mineralize it, turn it into rocks, carbonate rocks. Uh, it's a much safer, it's a much more long lasting, and it's a less troublesome uh, solution. And the third one is develop electricity storage for cars and the grid. So let's start to talk about these. First of all, um, shale gas. So uh, we heard a little bit about this in, uh, in Jim's talk. Uh, first of all, it's abundant. If you look on the upper right, you'll see all the places in the world where shale, where shale gas exists, and it's quite abundant in the US, uh, but it's also quite abundant in the rest of the world. So every place in the world can indeed tap into this resource. It has much lower carbon emissions than coal or oil, maybe a factor of two uh, if you compare it to oil, and a greater fraction if it's coal. Its price is low, so you see a comparison of prices over the period from 2005 to 2008, $12 at the peak, $8 at the average, and in January of this year it was $2. That price is much lower in the United States than the rest of the world, but it's still an enormous bargain at the present time. Here is the uh, prediction of the EIA. It now, shale gas takes 23%, provides 23% of our supply. It will be 49% in 2035. So the resource is really huge. So why is it important? A potential game changer, lower carbon emissions, energy security for all countries. It's a diversity of sources and uses, so you can replace coal for power production and oil for transportation with gas. Uh, but there are problems. Everyone knows about uh, hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And this uh, graph shows how fracking works. You drill a well straight down, and because the uh, the uh, shale seam is rather narrow, you then want to turn and drill horizontally, horizontally as far as you can. And you may want to drill in 360 degrees in order to get everything out of that seam. You then induce some explosions at the end of your far end of your well and then uh, sequentially at the nearer ends. Those explosions fracture the rock. You drive in hydraulic fracturing fluid, which has little grains of sand in it, which keep the fractures, the fissures open and you take the fluid away and the gas flows out or the oil flows out. So there are lots of problems with that. Uh, the main one is contamination. The fracking fluids are not things that you like to have in your home or even anywhere nearby you. So they can contaminate the water or contaminate the air. Uh, but there are also problems with just that technology. In fact, what you observe is a sharp, a sharp rise in uh, shale gas in the first year and then a decline after the first year, and you only get about 15% out. So there are some science challenges here, and this is one of the central points I want to make. You can't make this safe, and you can't get more than 15% out without understanding science. The science you have to understand is fissure mechanics, pore formation, fluid flow in mesoporous media, and these things are really important to look at, and they're within reach. These are things that science can address. The second thing is carbon dioxide mineralization. So we all talk about putting it underground and sequestration, but why not turn it into rock? It turns out, if you look in the upper right, that uh, carbon dioxide is very stable energetically, but carbonate rocks are even more stable. And if you look at the table below that, you see how much carbon is in the various reservoirs in the Earth. The atmosphere with about 720 gigatons, the surface ocean about the same, Deep ocean, which everyone talks about, much more capacity to store carbon, but carbonate rot rocks actually dominate everything, much bigger than the deep ocean. And you see what fossil fuels can produce, much smaller than the capacity of carbonate rocks. So they could absorb all of the carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and not even notice it. The good thing is that you get a powder like this, shown in the middle picture. That's what, that's, uh, what carbonate uh, looks like, calcium carbonate, let's say. Uh, or magnesium, you can use it to build buildings, limestone. You could use it as backfill from mines, so just store it on the surface of the earth, uh, and it doesn't require any monitoring. There are problems. The problems are slow reaction kinetics, so you need to find catalysts. This is something that science does well. And non-reactive coating, uh, you control the surface chemistry. That's something that science does well, too. What's the third thing? It's electricity. 
So electricity since 1880 has uh, become an increasing part of our lifestyle. It's now 40% of the primary energy, and if electric cars take off, it will be much more than that. Um, here's the electricity grid. You see how uh, this carrier has many sources. These are the sources that it gets from heat. It has to go through mechanical motion and a generator to produce electri electricity, then the power grid, and all the uses that electricity can be put to. Uh, in recent times, we have, in fact, better ways to produce electricity without the heat. So hydro, solar, uh, wind, uh, and fuel cells. And we heard some about that from Phil in the last talk. And it's actually a very clean, efficient, and versatile carrier, and the one that many predict will become dominant in the coming years. However, it has one problem. You can't store electricity. You have to make it at the same rate that you use it. So the challenge here is to get, essentially, electricity storage options, better batteries. You want to do that so that you can employ solar and the wind that Phil was telling us about, uh, store the energy when it's being produced, use it later when you need it and it's not being produced, and you want to use it for electric cars. So here's the Chevy Volt, and you see the battery is almost as big as the car. In fact, underlies the entire chassis. Uh, the electric cars have been described as batteries with a steering wheel on them. Uh, and we need to do better so that you can drive farther. There are ways, lots of ways, that you can do better. So the lithium-ion batteries that we all talk about, we can do much better than. You can use a doubly ionized magnesium or triply ionized yttrium as the working ion, factor of two or a factor of three in principle right there. Or you can use chemical reactions instead of the intercalation that we use at the cathode and the anode. Uh, and we can design flow batteries, which are designed for the grid, that have huge capacities, enough to take the output of, say, a solar farm or a wind farm. So the challenge is five times the energy density at one-fifth the cost. And in fact, Argonne has, along with many partners, uh, has submitted a proposal uh, to do that, which is now pending before the Department of Energy. Uh, so why do we need discovery science? This has been one of my themes. And this illustrates very graphically why we need it. The cost, of, if the cost of discovery is $1, the cost of development of a new technology is $10, and the cost of deployment of that technology is $100. So the discovery part is rather cheap. That's the place where we should be investing to know what we heard from Jim about dominant designs. The dominant designs haven't emerged yet, and you have to do this discovery research to find out which ones are going to be the most effective and become dominant. Uh, here's some other reasons why discovery science. It stimulates innovation. And as we heard from Jim this morning, that's what drives every wave of, uh, uh, of economic development. So it's the lifeblood of economic competitiveness and growth. You can't have that without innovation. That's what science is. It tells you what will fail before you attempt to develop it. So wouldn't you like to know that? Don't go that route. It's not going to work. There's some scientific reason why it can't. It pays back more than it costs in economic return, and that's obvious from the waves that we saw from Jim, but also just common sense tells you the economy thrives because the, the innovations that we have uh, are worth more than they cost. And it primes the innovation ecosystem. Here are some, here's a Wordle. You can find this uh, website that will create a Wordle for you from any document. This is the, these are the words that are associated with e uh, innovation ecosystems. So I want to leave you with a thought that Chicago has everything you need for an innovation system, ecosystem, and in fact, one in energy makes sense to locate here. Five powerful research universities, which I've listed there. Uh, a powerful national laboratory, that's Argonne National Lab. A very supportive city of Chicago, so Rahm Emanuel and the mayor and our chief sustainability officer, Karen Weigert, would love to make this happen. Very supportive state of Illinois, Governor Pat Quinn and others who would like to see the state of Illinois become an innovation ecosystem. And a very committed promoter of clean energy entrepreneurs, that's the Clean Energy Trust, and I'm sure there are others as well. So the challenge is to take these pieces and connect them together and make them 
the place, make Chicago the place for the next innovation in energy to happen. And I think I'll leave, leave you with that. Thank you.